Ujaid, everyone. Ujaid, glad to see everyone here. Uh, we're going to start right now. We could just ask if everyone could please shut your phones off, put them on vibrate or silent, if you would. We really appreciate it, and we're going to get started right now, okay? Ujjayi, everyone, greetings. Um, I would, before we begin, I would like to ask for permission from the elders if I can proceed. Do I? Okay. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, it's good to see so many faces here this evening. Wow. Um, just relax you know keep an open mind open up your heart to what's going to be presented to you this evening um, uh, there's many initiates that are here who are ready to serve you ready to you know uh, host you with anything that you need so please make sure that you you know communicate with us and let us know what you need uh, my name is Zamuni Hasati, and I am an initiate here at the Chicago Earth Center um, I would like to provide um, a, a bit of information, just a small history about the Earth Center. Um, the Earth Center is an international not-for-profit organization that was founded by a Dogon spiritual master and master healer by the name of Naba Lamusa Morodinabig. Um, the Earth Center was founded in 1996 and Master Naba he gained permission from his elders and the kingship of his people to come here to the diaspora in order to build a bridge and reconnect all of humanity to the comedic spiritual educational system. Now, originally the comedic educational system was kept in secrecy in the African bush. And it was kept in secrecy in order to preserve the knowledge, you know, to preserve it. So it's with the compassion and the sacrifices that Master Naba had in his heart to come and share this information with us, with all of us. So um, we just acknowledge him for those sacrifices. Um, again, this is a spiritual organization. This is a spiritual center. So it is important that I acknowledge all of our ancestors, all of your ancestors that paved the way for you to be here this evening, all of us to be here together, arriving safely. And we wish and ask that your ancestors return you to your destination after leaving here safely. Um, the Earth Center has three main branches. One of the branches is Firefly Productions. Another is Ancasta Natural Healing. And the last is the Mtom School of Comedic Philosophy and Spirituality. With Firefly Productions, um, it is our publishing house for all of the materials that um, you may see here um, to my right in the back. Um, there's many DVDs, CDs, pamphlets, books, the Rising Firefly magazine, and a free publication that we offer called the Sunnyside Newspaper. Um, Ancasta Natural Healing is an organization that was started by Master Naba. And it's a network of many healers who are from West Africa, whose goal is to, to preserve life. And the goal also is to ensure that people outside of, of Africa, outside of the continent, have access to traditional herbal remedies. 
And the last branch is the Mtom School of Comedic Philosophy and Spirituality. This school is a comedic initiation. And within the initiation, we offer three classes. Um, one of the classes is, is Sunt, which is traditional healing. Another one is Ka'at Ibi, which is meditation. And the last one is Medu Ma'it, which is language. Some of you may reference it as hieroglyphics. So really, the, the Earth Center the Earth Center's mission is to promote and protect traditional culture worldwide. Um, again, we just ask that you keep your minds and hearts open to what's being presented to you here today. Um, today's lecture is on the ancestral spirit. And the presenter of this lecture is one of the Earth Center's eldest students who were taught by Master Naba himself. His name is Nehez Miniu, and he was born and raised in Seattle, Washington. And in 2004, he came here to Chicago to begin his Mtam initiation. Um, Nehez is one of two out of 11 total initiates in his generation who were able to make it through this rigorous process of initiation. Um, he is also um, a traditional healer, along with one other um, healer that, who are both located here in the US. Um, upon Master Naba's transition in 2008, Nehez Minyu continued his journey with initiation, with the assistance of ancestors and the elders in the traditional, tradition initiations. Um, in 2013, he was appointed the International Director of the Earth Center, which means that he carries a big load of responsibility to all of the schools that we have. Now, the Earth Center, we, within the Earth Center, we have six locations. Five are here in the U.S., um, which is obviously here in Chicago, but we have one in Brooklyn, New York. We have two in California, one that's in San Diego, one that's in Los Angeles. And then we also have one that is located in West Virginia, Charleston, West Virginia. We have one in Burkina Faso located in the city of Ouagadougou. And we also have one location that's soon to be opened in the UK in 2014. Um, so I, without any further ado, I know everybody's been waiting for some time. We appreciate your patience. Um, but without any further ado, I would like to introduce Nehez Miniu. So let's give him a warm Welcome. Thank you, everyone. Ujjayi. Ujjayi is a greeting that we use in the Medu language. Uh, Medu is the oldest language of the continent of Africa and also the oldest language of humanity. And that's uh, the language that we teach here in the initiation that we offer in Mtown. I would like to thank everybody for coming out this evening. Uh, I see many new faces, happy to see many new faces. I know there are many new faces and ears uh, on the internet watching us now. This is the first time we've streamed live over the internet. Uh, we're happy to be doing so, hoping to reach many new people this evening. I would like to welcome you all, acknowledge your ancestors for pushing you or bringing you tonight, and also acknowledge Master Naba, my master, the founder of the Earth Center, the teacher of all of the students and initiates that you see 
here this evening and the initiates that are listening from all over the world. Master Nabe is the reason why we're here tonight. He's the reason why the Earth Center is functioning and is serving as a center for all of those who are interested in returning home to their traditions, returning home to their ancestral cultures, returning home to the knowledge that has been preserved and kept in the initiatic societies throughout the continent. So I am forever indebted to Master Nava and I thank him before I get started. Tonight, we're gonna be talking about the ancestral spirit. We're gonna be talking about the ancestral spirit, however, for any of you who have been to a lecture put on by the Earth Center, watched a lecture sold by the Earth Center, watched our YouTube, you'll find that we tend to go step by step slowly into our topics. So if you find yourself 20, 30 minutes into the lecture and you're like, when is this guy gonna start talking about ancestral spirit? <laughs> Just know that I'm going step by step to allow you to have the best understanding that you can have by the time we start actually talking about the subject at hand. We know, or let me say, I know, as the sister said, thank you Zamunita for the introduction. As the sister said, uh, I was born in the United States. I was born and raised in Seattle, Washington. I know where we stand in, in this side of the world. Meaning, I know what's taught in the colonial schools, I went to them. I know what's taught in the universities, I went to them. I know what's broadcasted on our news media. Journey with initiation. I know what's broadcasted in our news media. I know what's broadcasted uh, in all of our media sources. And for that reason, we have to speak to the collective uh, in the place that we're speaking. Because whenever we take in a journey, we have to start from where we're standing. So please be patient with me. I promise you we're going to get there step by step. Okay. As the sister said in introducing me as well, please keep an open mind. Because here at the Earth Center, we are presenting humanity's original culture. We are presenting a culture. We are presenting a culture that we all, in this side of the world, within the colonial territories, we've been educated to be separated from. This isn't hard to see. We could look into our history and even see our ancestors being physically removed from the culture we're talking about. Physically removed and physically uh, restrained from returning to that culture. Even after those physical restraints were removed, there were many restraints put on us mentally, spiritually, to prevent us from returning. So in dealing with all of that, we ask you to keep an open mind because we're gonna be bringing a new paradigm this evening. A new paradigm that you've been educated to find at the very least, you've been educated to find it foreign. Generally, you've been taught to find it scary. So I ask everybody to keep an open mind. We ask everybody when they enter the EC to do your best to leave your emotions at the door because when we look around us in the world today, we see that humanity is in a very serious situation. We fight in each other for whatever ideas we're holding on to at the time. We have people that look like brothers who are ready to kill one another over the colors on the flag, over even the colors on a bandana, over 
various things that various things that are new to us as a culture, that are new to us as a people. Things that our ancestors just a few thousand years ago weren't interested in, weren't involved in, knew nothing about today, they're important enough for us to kill one another. So we can't deny to ourselves that humanity is in a very serious, serious place. And whenever we're in a serious place, whenever we facing a serious problem, a serious issue, is everything okay with the IT? Whenever we're facing a serious problem, it's only the thought process that will get us out. We can be as angry as we want, we can be as sad as we want, we can put all of the emotion, emotional energy that we want up to it, but it, it's only when we can calm down and be like, what's really going on? And solve the issue slowly, methodically, that we get around it. And when we look into our history, we can see that we've been facing an issue for the last 2,000 years. We've been living under a foreign culture, a foreign language, foreign ideas for the last 2,000 years. And that culture doesn't seem to be serving us. That culture at every point in the history we can look at seems to keep us in the position of those you take from in order to live well. That's a serious problem and it's about time we try something new to solve it. So please take your time this evening, take your time with yourself, take your time with me, and we will go step by step into investigating this thing that we call the ancestral spirit. As I was saying, we can see now in what we call the year 2013 that politics is running our life. Politics is running our life. Even just recently, we all changed our clocks back. Do you call that back or forward? Because the politician said, you know what, in US, you, have, you need to do that. Did you know in other parts in the world they don't do that? Who, who knows that by show of hands? That means that it's the politician of the US that's controlling that for us. It has nothing to do with nature, has nothing to do with the sun's position, has nothing to do with the moon's position, has to do with the decisions that our politicians make to control our life. Well, that's the situation that we're in today. We can see when it serves the goals of our politicians, our time changes. We can look back in history and see when our calendar changed for that reason. We can see when it serves the politi politician, even our identity changes. Some people in the world, they live in a modern country. There's a border that runs through their ancestral lands and even some of their brothers and sisters live in the next country over. And then now the politician said, no, you now Senegalese, you now Gambian. No, you now Ethiopian, you now Eritrean. No, you now Californian, you now Mexican. And now these people are ready to kill each other, to keep each other out of their boundaries. When before, just few generations, they shared the same father. All because of the ideas and the decision making of the politician. This is the world we live in today. This is the situation that we call divide and conquer. And much has been done to divide and conquer amongst the ranks of humanity. To divide 
humanity into small portions that are more easily controlled that serve as easier resources for the politician to use. Because let's be clear on one thing. Those politicians that we're talking about, those leaders that we put our faith in, they need us. They need our attention. They need our energy. They need us in their workforce. They need us on their campaign team. They need us to do everything that gets done. No individual in the world does anything alone. So today's world has become a war of ideas. And each politician brings their own ideas fighting for our attention, fighting for our brains. So again, please, in that brain that you have now, keep an open mind because I'll be bringing some new ideas. But the ideas that I bring you, I assure you, they don't belong to Nehez Meniu. They don't belong to Nehez Meniu. I didn't sit somewhere and think, I think this would be good for these people to know. I think this would be good to lead these people where I want to lead them. All of the ideas that I will bring tonight, all of the knowledge that I will bring tonight is very old knowledge that my master passed to me, his master passed to him, his master passed to him, and so on and so on and so on. What I'm bringing you tonight is what exists in the knowledge system of Kemet, in the knowledge system of what we now call Africa, a knowledge system that has been kept secret for the past 2,000 years. As you can see, step by step, everybody still with me? This is just the introduction. Okay. Um, just to loosen things up, because I know you've already gotten a lot of information. We told you what the Earth Center was about. We're talking about those difficult things to digest, uh, what's going on between the people and the politician. I want to introduce a story at this time. And this story is going to help us to get to where we're going. This story takes place in a country in West Africa or Western Merita called Togo. Has anybody here heard of Togo? Togo is a very small country on the uh, coast of West Africa. Its borders are Ghana. I know if you haven't heard of Togo, you've heard of Ghana. Uh, and on the other side, on the eastern side, it's bordered by Benin. In the coastal region of Togo, there was a man named Kofi. There was a man named Kofi, which is a very, a very, uh, very common name in that area. You find people all along the coast named Kofi. Kofi in the coastal region of West Africa in that area is like John in America. So there was this man named Kofi, and I say that because this man is like many men there. This man is like many men there because Kofi has spent the last 10 years of his life studying engineering in France at big universities. Kofi was lucky enough, uh, as seen in, the, in his city, he was one of the lucky ones. Because of his scores in colonial school, because of his uh, output at his university, his government chose him for special uh, programs in France where he would learn more about engineering. So Kofi was sent to France from Togo. His mother and father, like any good mother and father, saved all of their money to help him get there because they were told that after he finishes, he would finish with a good job and a lot of money and a good life. So Kofi spent 10 years in France studying. 
while he was there, he met a lady. He married that lady, and he had a, a son. The son is now five years old. Five years old when Kofi and his new wife returned to Togo to put into play what he's learned now in French, the French university. But I should say, a few years after Kofi's parents saved the money and sent Kofi for university in France for a better life, a few years after that, his father passed away. And so his mother was left to work hard to farm for her sustenance. She was widowed. She's alone. She's farming for her sus sustenance. She only had one child in Kofi. When Kofi and his wife returned, she was so happy. She was so happy because now she's living with her only son, his wife, and her new grandson. As you can imagine, she's on top of the world because that's what any parent is going to do. Any parent, they receive a baby, they're going to make sacrifices to do what's best for that baby in hopes that as that baby's coming in to life, they can give them the best they can offer. And when it's time for that mom to leave life, she can hope that baby's going to turn around and say, okay, you know what? You did so much for me. Let me give you the best before you leave. And so she saw that opportunity arising. And so all of the suffering became worth it. She was happy to see Kofi come back. So she lived with Kofi and his family, or his new wife and his son, for some time. Years passed. And throughout those years, Kofi's wife made it very clear that she didn't like Kofi's mom living with them. She wanted to live alone as a family like all of the rest of the people in France and in the modern world are doing. So Kofi thought about it. And one day at breakfast, they're eating breakfast, and at the end of breakfast, Kofi says, Mom, you know what? I'm tired of you in our household. I'm going to send you to go live with my, one of my aunts. And Kofi looking at uh, Kofi's mom's looking at him in the eye, stunned. What? She she can't even talk. She's stunned. She's trying to figure out what's happening between her and her only son. The only son that they that her and the father sacrificed so much for. But she can't talk. She don't know what to say. She looks down and under her breath, as if she's talking to herself, she said, but you're my only son. If me and your father only thought about us, you wouldn't even be here. And she starts getting her bag ready. Kofi and his wife act like they didn't hear the comment. You know, they're just waiting for her to get ready, to get her bag ready so that he can take her to, to his aunt's house. So she readies her bags, and as she's preparing her bags and coming to the door, she hugs her grandson very tightly. And in a last attempt at pride, she tells herself she's not gonna she's not gonna cry. She's not gonna cry. She's gonna act like she's okay with it. She's gonna act like she's happy. But she hugs the grandson, and the grandson is crying. And Kofi turns to his grandson. He says, son, it's OK. Everybody needs to live alone. Old people are like parasites. They suck you. We have, to, we have to live alone if we want development. So the grandma says, well, now she's thinking about what's on the other side of that door. So she said, you know what? I don't even have a blanket for tonight. I need a blanket. Quickly, Kofi says, son, go get a blanket. Grandma needs a blanket. So Kofi's son runs into the other room, and he's there searching for a blanket. And he's there for a while. 
you know, there's tension in the house now. You're standing with grandma at the door, and now Kofi's son's taking a long time to find that blanket. And they hear him searching, like he's searching for the blanket. They're waiting, staring at each other, making small talk. Oh, auntie gonna be happy to see you. All of this, you know, trying to hide the fact of what's really happening at the time. And then, at a certain point, the tension gets too much for Kofi, and he says, what? What's going on with this kid? And he goes to look in the room, and he sees Kofi sitting on the bed, holding a pair of scissors, and using the scissors on the blanket. He said, what are you doing destroying your grandmother's blanket? He said, I'm cutting it into two equal halves. He said, for what? What are you going to use the other half for? What are you doing? He said, well, I was going to cut it in two equal halves, hide the second half, so that when I'm big and it's time for me to push you out of the house, I have this to give you. And Kofi received that like a smack in the face. Kofi standing there with his mouth open. Well, this story, this story expresses many, many things. And I know this story we can relate to in the modern world. As I travel around the world, I lecture in the colonial territories of the world, I see many Kofis. Many people sent to the modern territories of the world to find a better life. Many people who left their ancestral land, their farms, all of the wealth that existed there to live here, check to check, trying to pay for the utilities and the bills you get in your 200 by 200 square foot apartment. So even if you're not Kofi, you're the child of Kofi, or you're the child of the one who was forced to be Kofi. This is how vulnerable the human being is. Because those values that we hold, those new values that we accept, Kofi just accepted some new values. Those new values that we accept, in, we tend to think of them as our own. But Kofi only had the values that French University put in Kofi. Kofi's child will only have the values that Kofi puts in his child. Kofi's mom only had the values that her parents put in her. That's the secret behind a human being. A human being seems so complex, but really the human being is very simple because the human brain can't invent. Meaning, I can't sit somewhere and think about things I've never been exposed to. Everything I think about is what I've been exposed to or a mixture of some things I've been exposed to. And this goes very deep because us here, we've been exposed to English. Maybe some of us are lucky enough to speak a, a second language. For the rest of us, we might think our minds are powerful, and they are, but those minds are even limited by the language of English. If the word don't exist in English, it don't exist in your mind. That's what a human being is. We like a sponge that soaks up whatever is around us. And those are the resources now we have to live and to go through our life. This is this aspect of how, oh, is everybody okay? Okay, okay, good. This is the realities of the human being. This is how serious our situation is because now those politicians we come to, they now can put the values that we live by 
And once we have those values with us, we hold on them like we're the ones that brought them. Like we're the ones that fathered them. Like anybody speaking with a value that goes against it, they're attacking us. But we, didn't, we don't realize we just fighting for the one that gave them to us. We're just a soldier of the one who put them there for us. So, when we're talking about, when we're talking about the, this aspect of our vulnerability, this aspect of how it's easy to change the values of humans. Because remember, Kofi's father and Kofi's mother, they didn't think like Kofi's thinking today. It just took 10 years, and now the university put new ideas in Kofi. Even you hear the story, you may want to blame Kofi's wife. Well, it's her fault. Kofi's wife is just a product of the same schools Kofi went to go study in. She's just a victim to those who were in her receiving team when she came to life. We're all victims to them. All we can do is hope they're going to have the best interest in mind for this new baby they're seeing. So, if we really think about this aspect of the human mind and we think about where we stand in now, we turn around, we look at our history, we look at who taught us. We can see our parents taught us. Well, who taught them? Maybe their grand, our grandparents taught them. Well, who taught them? And so on and so on and so on. And we can see these values that we hold in and we fight in each other now. We can trace them to their origins. We could trace them in their history of where they're coming from and who exposed, who had the exposure that became all of these schools of thought that we now live in under, that we now hold in, that we now carry in the flag of as if it's representing us. Well, tonight we're talking about the ancestral spirit. So tonight I want to talk more so on the spiritual dimension because when we're talking about the ancestors, we're talking about what you can't see. And when we look into the schools of thought that are teaching us about what we can't see, we can see various religions all around the world. Various religions very, very serious about this fight I was talking about to control our minds. The wars that religions have brought to the world has killed more than the, the wars that weren't about religion. Look into the history. The Crusades, the Holy Wars, the Jihads, all of them kill more than any other reason human beings are fighting for. So when we look at these religions and we're thinking about spirituality, we're thinking about looking into this unseen aspect of our existence and where the human being is coming from and therefore where, what the human being should be honoring. We see many, many religions bringing many, many, many different ideas. But in the traditions, we have a very simple way of looking at it. Because when we're talking about spirituality, when we're talking about the human being's origins, no matter if you look in science, no matter if you just sit and uh, deduce from what you can learn in today's world, and what the traditions are saying, is everything comes from four elements. When you're looking into healing, when you're looking into spirituality, wherever you're looking, better be starting with these four elements. 
and that's very basic for all of us. The four elements everybody should know, right? What are the four elements? F fire, air, water, earth, right? Everybody knows. This is short of the scientists that want to claim they, they know new things and so they're adding new things to those four. No, those four always existed. You ask any human in any time, in any era, they're not going to tell you, no, there's no fire. There's, no, there's always been fire. There's always been air. There's always been water. There's always been earth. And everything you see is just made out of that. So if we're talking about a spirituality that's going to help us to understand where these things are coming from and when we can look around us and the basic components of all of those things is in those four things then the spirituality better be based in those four things right because in general spirituality is just about our origins but as I'm saying the politicians whatever new bright idea they have our religious leaders, whatever new bright idea they have, they do a good job and put a lot of effort, a lot of weapons into being able to change our minds when they need our attention to go somewhere else. So we can see when we look through history, this has been done again and again and again. Because in humanity's original culture, which we're gonna start talking about more and more. In the comedic culture, everything was about the origins. Everything was about honoring our origins. That's where you come from. That's what has allowed you the opportunity to live this life you enjoying now, to live this life you facing now. And nowadays, our teachers, our leaders have many, many ideas about where we're coming from, right? Even my master, everybody can see the picture of my master there. Everybody can see my master's daughter standing in the back of the room. You see her, you see what she looks like. You see what my master looks like. French teachers came into his village and told him that his ancestors, where he comes from, have blonde hair and blue eyes and come from France. I mean, it shouldn't, it shouldn't really surprise us because they told us the same thing. They told us the same thing, that there was an original man and an original woman. They have blonde hair and blue eyes and they're dealing with snakes and apples. Everybody remembers that, right? <laughs> and then those of us who like, no, I don't know about that. We need to be a little bit more reasonable. And then the science on this side come and say, well, yours came from monkeys. It's evolution. So this is what, just a few of the examples of the many attempts they make at confusing our origins, at blocking us from our origins. Well, Let's go through some more examples because this is going to help. In the traditions, and if you all, we invite you to spend some time after the lecture to look into some of the products that we have. You will see that we have a calendar. The calendar that we present at the Earth Center is a calendar based off of the it's a calendar based off of sidereal astrology meaning the earth's position in relation to the sun and another star sidereal and the star that this calendar is based off of is the Sirius star or the Sothe star this was the original calendar that uh, humanity used you look into the history books you look into the schools of archaeology the schools of anthropology you won't find a calendar older than this. This was the calendar that was used during the pharaonic times. This is the calendar that was used during the pre-dynastic pre times. This calendar works on a 10-day week. 
they're going to be passing some out so that you all can see what I'm talking about. This calendar, can I see one just to show our viewers? This calendar works on a 10-day week. When we're talking about our origins, when we're talking about the origins of human culture, what's beautiful about the origins is that they always fit. They come with the logic that exists in the universe, so everything fits. So the calendar you see, it has a 10-day week. We counted the days in tens. That seems logical, right? I mean, don't we have 10 fingers to count? That seems like it fits, right? If I'm going to count anything, I'm going to start here, right? So these weeks come in 10-day cycles. When the political leaders in the new spiritual revolutions led by the Roman Empire, when they came into our ancestral continent, they came into Africa, they saw that our spiritual system was really our foundation, our basis. Everybody, even to this day, can look at Africa and everybody seems like, oh, well, you know, you don't really go in Africa. You don't really know what those guys are doing. Because everything is about their spiritual system and nobody can see the beginning and the end of their spiritual system. And anything you can't see and you can't understand is going to be a little frightening because a white man hasn't controlled it yet. <laughs> right? So... Their spirituality was their foundation. Even their reason for keeping time had to do with spirituality. I mean, why else are you going to be keeping time? You can say, well, maybe you're keeping time because you need to know when to plant, when to harvest, et cetera, et cetera. But we have some tribes that hunt for food, hunt for meat, gather. they hunters and gatherers, right? Even to set your food production, on schedule like that is so that you can do it intelligently so you can have time left over to invest in your spirituality and in what you need to do. Now we're talking about the origins. These are the pure origins coming from Kemet. So there were 10 day weeks. When the Roman political leaders came in, they saw their strength is in their spirituality. The reason we can't win in this war of ideas is because their ideas are very grounded in this spiritual system that they have. They said, okay, what can we do to interrupt that? Well, if they schedule their spiritual spirituality on this calendar, let's target that. And so first, these political leaders came out with an order that the week would change from 10 days to five days. And you can check, call your, your, your friends from Merita, your friends from Africa, those Kofis that you know. Call them and ask them to ask their grandparents, do you remember having five-day weeks in Africa? And they'll say, yeah, we, we remember that. The elders tell us, yeah, they were five-day weeks. But when the Roman army changed the week to five days, from 10 days, I mean, what does that really stop us? Now two weeks, now what was one week is just two weeks. That you, you, you have to be, I don't know what kind of intelligence you have to think that's really gonna change a lot, right? That's pretty easy equation to solve. Now what was one is just two. So we can still track everything and keep everything aligned. And the Roman army saw that. The Roman leaders saw that. So they said, no, we need to do something more. And that's when it was then changed to seven days. And seven is a lot harder to keep track because seven don't fit into 10. 
Now, remember we said the origins, they always fit. And anybody listening to me now, please, this is the Earth Center. We're not bringing any doctrines to you. We're not forcing you to accept anything. We're just asking you to wake up that mind. To wake up that mind and start thinking about those values you've been given and that you maybe were thinking were yours. Start using your mind and deducing if they match you or if they match the ones that have been colonizing you and oppressing you for the last 2,000 years. And if you answer that question, then find out what fits you. So, we talked about the 10 days. Very easy to see how that fits. Why would we count seven days? In nature, why are we gonna, where we have seven to think, yeah, this is a good way to count time. That's, that's what I said to, to that question. So, but it's interesting because everybody knows we're an adaptable people. Hum humanity is very adaptable. So we were given these seven days, even to this day. You see many tribes, many cultures kept their culture even with seven days. Even through the, fi through the fire, through the onslaught of all of the threats, all of the, uh, the torture, the killing that the Roman army and the descendants of those colonizers came, the descendant cultures of those colonizers came and continued, they still kept their culture through that. And even today when you check the names for the days of the week that any culture in West Africa has given to Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, those days of the week exist in the secret in the secret culture that help people to stick to their culture cuz that's how we adapt meaning even the name Kofi is a name you give to a child when they're born a particular day of the week and you see this all around West Africa the names that are given and even the the names of the days of the week of the seven day week today have to do with which temples the people that know are supposed to go and serve on those days so that maybe in front of the Roman army you're like yeah we're following the seven day you know today is Taladi we all know we all know no problem but any anybody in the initiation knows oh it's Taladi I need to make sure I go and serve the temple two miles this way Oh, today is Sibiri. I need to make sure I go and serve the temple two miles this way. So we hid the culture. And you saw that many, 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 many places. That's how we preserve the culture. But for the children of Kofi, how are we to know that? Because we wake, we wake up in life and our parents just taught us Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We don't know why Grandpa called it Sibiri, Taladi, and all the rest, Lauterba, La Musa. We don't know why that happened. So now we just go with the way, the direction that Kofi gave us. So this is just another example. The week that you are now using, the week that we now using, the seven-day week, it was given to us in divide and conquer to make sure they can take the power away that came from us being connected to our spiritual system. And now we, we can use those minds towards any direction we want to lead them as their political leaders now. You can check it, check the history. Uh, is everybody following me now? Okay. Everybody's wondering when we're gonna start talking about ancestors, right? I mean, we already kind of talking about it though. This is, this is our ancestral culture now. And the calendar is very, very important because the calendar is what they based, based it on. So in this story about Kofi, I chose this story tonight because it's very, very important. Because even what has come from this type of mind frame, we see all around us.
now we're ready to turn our elders away. What do we put them in old folks' homes, with convalescent homes? We say, no, it's too much time to take care of you. It's better if you go. And we even, you know, you can have the biggest, the best TV. What kind of TV you want? I get you that TV. And then these people who sacrifice their whole life for us find themselves with their favorite couch and their favorite TV and visiting hours. But even on a societal level, you see it the same way. Because if at one time we look to our elders as those who have experienced everything, maybe they move a little slower, but they watched everything, they have more wisdom to help us to handle the problems we're facing. In our traditional cultures, they were the ones that were respected. We serve in them because now that wisdom is what we want to use as a resource. We don't want to have to make the same mistakes they made or their fathers made. If we can make sure to serve them and they can serve us with that wisdom, everybody benefits. So, can I have a towel or something? So, um, but nowadays you look into the modern world and in the modern world, you see everybody seems to be following the youth. Whatever fads Little Wayne sets, don't, that, ain't that what we're doing now? Even I see our grandmas following the fads Nicki Minaj sets. Aren't we, aren't we all, you see older people wearing hip clothes now and things like this? This is the logic that comes from what you're seeing in that story. We're chasing the elders out. Why will the elders want to look like elders if they just get kicked out to the old folks' home if they look like elders? So now they're chasing to be cool with the kids. That's a society upside down. That's a society upside down. Now you see Grandpa wearing chains and even... I grew up in Southern California. You know, Southern California, like Chicago, has a big gang life. In Southern California, I used to be around some of my family members that are involved in things like that, and I see people I call grandpa in the gang. Hey, oh man, you know what happened? So on and so forth, so forth, came over on. I'm like, what? Because the elders are now even following the youth because that's our value system now. Well, that's upside down. I'll say it again, that's upside down. And that's what the new modern system, these ideas that we hold in, we call in our own. Well, no, I can't afford, I have to make my career. I have to build my career, I have to build my wealth. I don't have time to take care of my, my, my father. I don't have time to take care of my mother. And they would do that better anyway. They're all set up for it at the retirement home. We give ourselves all kind of reasons. But the reality is the value system now for the human being has been turned upside down. <coughs> this has been done on many levels. I'm using the phrase turned upside down for a reason. Because the values of the hum human have been turned upside down. Thank you. They have been turned upside down. How many of you have seen one of our publications, The Rising Firefly? Okay. On The Rising Firefly, you'll see, even on the back of your calendar, there's a badge at the bottom that's talking about, you know, doing work in Merita. And you see the continent of Africa turned upside down what you might call upside down. Well, this is the orientation on space that our ancestors had. When you look at the map, when you look at the lands, when you look at the earth, our ancestors saw the south at the top and the north at the bottom. So when I'm saying your new leaders have turned the world upside down, it's not a joke. That's exactly what they did. That's exactly what they did.
But remember, I said everything that your ancestors had, the origins of things, it fit. It fit in this existence because it's based off of nature. So when we're talking about the orientation of the map, when we're talking about how the map looks, or how we see ourselves in space, how we look at the map, it all fits. When, remember, I was talking about this, the oldest language that humanity has. The oldest language humanity has, if you look on the calendar there, you see it on the front. On the side is what we know as, in the colonial world, is what we know as hieroglyphs, Egyptian hieroglyphs. Uh, in the culture, we call it medu. Medu. In the oldest, in the Medu language, the word for south is resut. And uh, you could also use the word resut to mean forward. Like if I'm standing and I'm orienting myself against the compass, the ancestral compass, I face south to be forward. The word for north, it mean it was met. But you also say met can also be translated to drowned or full. We're gonna come back to that in a second. And the word for left was east. The word for east, which is uh, yapt, also can be translated as left. The word for west, which is imint, also can be translated as right. So everything is there, hidden in the language. Like I said, go check for yourself. You don't, you don't need to take my word for it. Please don't take my word for it. I could be telling you anything tonight. Check behind me and prove for yourself. That's what opening up this mind is about. So remember I said the word for north, one word is met. Another word is ha, which means backwards. I could have used that one. That one is easy to understand. But another one is met. Now, if you look at the planet, you look at the planet Earth, you see at the South Pole, what do you have? You have Antarctica, ice, cold. But Antarctica is a land mass, right? And on the north, you have what? Polar ice caps, just ice, water. So that's what we mean by drowned. The north is drowned. But when you look in nature, where do you see water just sit on top of land? Nowhere. Water always drains down to where it can't drain anymore, right? So how can we be thinking that north, the one holding the water, no land has came out, is the top. We don't see that anywhere in nature. Everybody following me? Now you see how this fits. You come back to our ancestral culture and your mind just kind of, oh my gosh, finally something that fits. I can rest. I can loosen up a little bit. Because now all these ideas, the new, the new leaders, the new religious leaders, the new philosophers are bringing, it's like you have to cram them in the mind. No, shut up, just take it. We need this, we need this degree. We need this grade, just take it. But it don't fit. Let me take it one step further. Because time is another thing that was misconstrued. We talked about the calendar. If you look at the clock, and if you now think about the orientation I'm talking about, east is on your left. West is on your right. Now you see that the hand of the clock now moves clock, I mean the sun now moves clockwise. So now the sun is moving from east to west just like the hands of the clock are moving. Well the hands of the clock came from your ancestors, not Big Ben or anybody else they told you. It came from your ancestors and it fits in a human being waking up to the world around them and trying to figure out what's going on in this world. Let me count this world with my 10 fingers. Let me check, there's land at the top, that's the top. There's water at the bottom, that's the bottom. Let me look towards the front, towards the top, and follow the sun. 
and let me make a mechanism that will follow it for me. All of it fits. Nothing else, nothing fits that they're talking about, but we just fit in in ourselves because that's the way our lives are being controlled. Well, this, as you can see, is a very, very serious subject. This idea that I'm talking about, controlling the time, is so much serious than we can understand in one lecture. Because when you control the time, everything is controlled. If I don't know where I'm standing in space or time, what can I know? Don't everything start with that? If I'm trying to talk to the sister here, but I don't know where I'm standing in space and time, how do I know I'm standing in the time she's in front of me? How do I know I'm standing in the space she's in front of me? Then I try to talk to her, and I miss that time, I miss that space, and I'm talking to myself. And we call that craziness, right? That's how serious what we're talking about is. Because when we're talking about spirituality, when you pray, who you're honoring, what aspect of your origin you're honoring, all of that was done on a certain time. I talked about the lady in front of me. But if I'm talking about whatever God you choose to honor, how do you know you're talking to them? How do you know they didn't leave? Our ancestors mapped all of that out. And that's what a calendar is about. That's what a clock is about. It's not just about for you to know, OK, job starts. And you all of the ones that's coming after. All of that is in you. Every time you say I, every time you say we, you're talking about all of that. If we're talking is ex ex existential reality, if we're talking the reality of energy, the reality of the way things work, not just the reality of the system you live in, it. the way things are, we have to see those logics are what fit. Those logics are what fit. So now, if these political leaders have got me to turn away from my culture that honors elders, that even makes sure to honor those who pass away, but those people are in me, what does that mean? And we wondering why we depressed, why we killing ourselves? Even on the very basic level we're not even trying to pull this any 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 further than what you can see and deal with right now even on the basic level that's going to create an imbalance in you you mean the core of myself i'm scared of but just the, the thing i can see in the face and dress up like Nicki minaj and 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 little wayne that's the one i i care for that's already mental illness so no wonder that the result of that is us killing ourselves. No wonder of the result of that is us not being able to follow health guidelines and things like that. We just slowly taking what's going to destroy ourselves. We don't even know what ourself is. So, as I was saying, that was the whole subject I want you to take, okay? Start seeing yourself as more than what your political leaders have taught you to see yourself as. Because when you follow the logic, you, you have to admit, there's no empty space. If there's no empty space, a lot of things in me. Even the way we see it in the traditions is, you are the projection in this moment of those ancestors. And those ancestors are the projection into the past of you. I'm going to say that again so everybody can take it home and meditate on it. You are the projection of your ancestors in this space and time. And your ancestors are the projection of you into the past. Now, I was saying that not everybody has ancestors. And that's because if you live in your life scared of those that aspect of you you, you don't have answers you only have dead relatives that are wake waiting to be awakened for you 
just like in our waking reality. A mother and a father, they get together, they have a baby, the baby comes, they have to take care of the baby. If they don't take care of it, they say, okay, it's here, let's turn our back. There's no chance for the baby, right? Unless somebody else comes along and does it. But human beings, we can't survive alone. I said that all night. So when we're born in this world, we hoping on those we come to, to take care of us long enough where we can have the strength to do it ourselves. And there are stages on that. There's a stage, like I said, we start to be able to use that mind. Everything starts working fully where we can start to reason. There's a stage when we start to talk. There's a stage we start to walk. There's all of these stages in the, in the growth process. That's in the world of the living. Now, the culture you exist in, like I said, they're scared of old people. They're scared of death because old people just get you closer to death. That's scary. The culture we're living in is so scared of death that the wisdom our ancestors passed down to humanity to say, you know what? The bigger aspect of the world you're living in that exists in death, it has stages too. It has complexity too. You don't just die and it's all milk and honey, rivers of milk and honey and white all around you and you just kind of sit and feel good and enjoy your favorite things for the rest of your life. What part of nature you see working like that? How can harmony work like that? Nature exists because it has a harmony that allows for its survival. How can the other side of life just be pristine and white and you just sit and you just kind of float? You just kind of enjoy yourself, whatever you like, whatever type of women you like. You know, we have to wake up and stop swallowing these pills that are so just weird. That's just retarded, right? Okay. So, our ancestors, the knowledge system of our ancestors, the knowledge system of Kemet, takes into account this whole picture. As I said, the human beings travels from birth to life to getting older to death and then the cycle that happens there until you come back to life. When a human being dies, there's a very good analogy that we're going to use. You may have heard it in the past if you've heard lectures from the Earth Center. When the human being dies, I want everybody to follow me, try to conceptualize what I'm saying. When the human being dies, we say it's like going to a place you've never been before. You've never been before, you wake up there. Is foreign to you. They don't speak your language. You don't recognize any of the environment. You don't recognize any of the people. You don't recognize any of the logics that allowed you to survive here. You're helpless. Every time you see somebody, you try to go walk to them they run from you because you don't have anything to take care of yourself with. Just like you're born in this world naked, you're born in that world naked, no resources on you. So I'm gonna come walking to you naked, I don't speak your language, you're gonna run from me. How will you feel if you find yourself in a place like that? That's the worst type of helplessness, the worst type of desperation you can think of, right? You don't know where you are. You don't know how you got there. You're trying to find somebody to help you. Everybody's running. This is how it is, the first phase of death. And we can imagine this how it is, the first phase of life, too. Right? You hear now some doctor smacking you. If you're not lucky, maybe if you're lucky, you're still born to parents, and, and still you're trying to recognize them. You're trying to figure out what's going on. You don't know. You're naked. You can't talk to them. So remember, it's like two sides of, you know, it's like the other side of life. 
So we have to go by what we know to be able to try to understand it. So the first phase of death we enter is a situation comparable to that. Now think of yourself in that desperation. Think of yourself in that helplessness. Now think if one of those people you tried to walk up to, you saw them coming, even before you could walk up to them, they had a package, they said, hey, how you doing? Are you, what's your name? Are you Brianna? Oh, this is for you. This from your child back on earth. You open it up, it has your clothes, has your resources to survive with, it has what? It has a meal, all of the things you need, it has it inside. And maybe you have a child back on earth, His name is Brian, and Brian sent it for you. What are you gonna think? How are you gonna feel then? Relieved, right? You're gonna be relieved and man, if, I mean I don't, Emotions don't exist there like they do here, but if I have to understand it, I never felt so much love for Brian before in my life, right? <laughs> what can I do for Brian to repay him for this? Well, that's how your ancestors are sitting waiting for you. The calendar that I handed out, if you look on the calendar, every 10 days, according to Remember, the energy is present. The energies that, that open up existence to some things or the energies that make existence uh, open or favorable for some things. Every 10 days, your ancestors come and visit you. Come looking. Looking for that package. You either put it out or you didn't. They either now receiving it, feeling all of that, what can I do for you? Or they putting their head down and walking back naked the person still act like I'm not here. Now keep in mind, we can't separate ourselves from them. Even while I'm giving you this analogy, we can't separate ourselves from them. I can't look in the mirror and say, I don't, that part of me is not from mom. That part of me is not from dad. That part of me is me, Nahes. Because everything I got, I got from them. Even if it's not, even if I'm trying to say it's not associated with them, it's just associated with one of their parents, right? So I can't separate myself from those ancestors. And if those ancestors are suffering, waiting to be taken care of, waiting to be honored, but no, you here scared of those ancestors because white men said, don't grow old, don't die. We're thinking of new ways you can get around it. You can come and get the tummy tucked. You can come and get the facelift. All of those things. You see how our culture is aimed? And then they're telling us it's progress. No, you stopping progress. That's the natural progress a human being has had to face since we could count, since we saw nature. You, that's what you stopping. What progress are you taking us to? So this is very, very important because now if you think about the other side of Brianna having that love for Brian, if Brianna's coming every 10 days and if Brianna's coming every 10 days and instead of offering that package, Brian is saying, no, I can't deal with my ancestors. I don't want to get old. I'm even going to worship the gods that the people that killed my ancestors, that killed Brianna, want me to worship. Push Brianna to the side. That's not my savior. Now, what do you think she would feel like then? If she can, she's going to curse Brian, right? Is she going to be wrong for that? Who can say she's wrong for that? Just like we talked about with Kofi, she put sacrifice in. She sacrificed herself. She fact sacrificed her life. She sacrificed her fun so that she can give Brian a chance. And now Brian's here, but he said, no, I'm scared of you. This religion said it's the way to go. 
all I have to do is look into the history. I see where this religion killed my ancestors, but my ancestors were bad. This religion is good. because, And you can't even bring Brian because he was taught that even before the mind could think. This is our situation. This is our situation. We wondering why we cursed? Of course we cursed. If as a people, a part of ourself, we estranged from it, we even hating it. We even scared of it. That's already cursing ourselves. Of course, our ancestors cursing us because they depended on us like we depended on them when they were, they were here. Now, we want to talk about doing something for our people, doing something for ourselves. We can't talk about organizing if you're not even organized in yourself, in your being. You can't talk about organizing for some political cause or some environmental cause. You have to be organized here first. some you know way around the laws and we built all kinds of you know education systems about this and about that all of that is fine but you have to be organized in yourself first if all of your actions and the way you live your life say i hate myself what success you're going to find in your activities at the earth center we know that for this reason life don't belong to us just like I said, everybody came here through the same door. That means the blood you have in your vein now, it came from somewhere. Somebody passed it to you. Somebody passed it to you, and you hold it now for the time being before you have to pass it, and then you have to enter the world of the dead. Somebody passed it to you, and they had it passed to them from somebody, and it is very, 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 very old. That's the blood in you. Remember I said those ancestors are in you. They're very, very, very old. All of the heights you saw them go to, all of that is in you. But you only joking with yourself if you think you can achieve anything slightly close to that while you hating them, ignoring them. That's where it starts. So then the question is, hopefully on everybody's mind, how does one turn these dead relatives into ancestors? It's very, very simple. It's very simple, and you have different stages of how to do it. Just like I said, there's different stages. You have to ensure the survival of ensure the survival and ensure the well-being of your babies when they come when an when a person dies in this world they become like a baby or born in the other world and you have different things that can be done to make sure you bring them up a level make sure you take care of their well-being and ensure their survival where they are at the novice level at the level for every one in society to make sure that they're doing. It doesn't take much more than a small food offering every 10 days. I mean, everybody makes food, right? This what this what white man told you be scared of? Everybody makes food. And please, everybody understand, I say white man, I'm not talking about the man, the human being that look like us that you might call white. Because humanity is a lot closer than the divide and conquer is telling us. It's a lot closer. If I have a, a child with a woman that's European today, and that child has a child with another European, my blood, the one I gave my children, is going to look white, what we call white, just three generations. And then maybe they go back to liking blacks, and then they look black again in just three generations. And we all family. That's how close humanity is. Those are the mental games being played on us. We killing each other for that. We standing strong out oh, that she better not come in here and all of that and all of that. For what? Give her 
three generations, she's going to look darker than you. You see how weird we are with our life? Remember, I said leave your emotions at the door. If you don't like what I'm saying, you go home, you think about it. Because that's how close humanity is. That's how close humanity is. So, I was saying, the white man I'm saying when I say white man really is the representation of this system. Because this system has separated humanity and they made one portion of humanity think they white and everybody different is something different. Before we didn't have that in humanity. Before these new modern thoughts came, you didn't see that in humanity. You didn't have one person saying, I'm white. You had different shades. I'm not saying you didn't look different. But you didn't have one saying, I'm white only because I'm different than you. Because you go into Africa in the bush, you're going to see people whiter, lighter skinned than the ones you call white. If you haven't been, go look. I'm not lying. So what really is your leader talking about when he's telling you that? He's talking about the values. And the values are that white culture is the one teaching us to be afraid of making food. All it takes on a basic level to make a meal, maybe a meal you would eat, maybe a meal you knew they liked. You put it in a clean place in your house. You say, this is for my grandma who, who I grew up with, my grandma so-and-so. I'm hoping this gets to you. I want you to be okay where you are, and I want you to be watching over me where I am. That's all it takes. At the beginning level, that's all it takes. Food, you can also even put water. Water, milk, things you knew they liked to drink. That's the basic level. And this just human culture now. You look on any continent in the world, humans do this. No matter what they, they look like, whatever, no matter what your political te leaders taught you to call them, they do this. Because that's what a human being is. A human being can't be separate from the ancestors that made them who they are. And so everybody that has a healthy society, they know to take care of that aspect of themselves. So this is the basic level. This can be done for all of the ancestors that are there waiting on the channel between you to them to gain some sustenance for their survival on that side. If you have a relative that passes away, there's things that can be done to make sure that as soon as they enter the world of the dead, they're being taken care of. Usually there's a sepulchral offering or a food offering given five to 10 days after they pass, another one given in 30 days, another one given in 90 days. This is the novice level. And these things start to create that harmony in yourself, create that harmony with your ancestors. These are the things that have been taken from our people. Every new religion that has come, they leave out ancestors because that's the part that even allows you to be gaining some power in yourself. That's why if we honest, if we look at the history books and take our emotions out of it, the religions are just political movements. Everyone that came they came to bring our power down, divide us, so that we can be led towards whatever leader was holding them, wherever he wants us to go. Because spirituality starts with our origins. It starts with our origins. How long have I been talking? Uh, Seneca, Seneca, you just came in. <laughs> <laughs> How long have I been talking to somebody? Uh, hour, 45 hour 45 minutes. Okay. I'm not I'm not finished. Okay, I'm not finished. So um this is very important. There's another level to this that is done by the professionals uh to even give more power and more um 
have more influence over our ancestors that left and this is what really a lot of the spiritual um, technology or spiritual system that we are afraid of in Africa is about because it's just about humanity's full existence it's not just about what you can see now and that's basic everything you look at in life you know if you're going to be intelligent about it you have to look past what you first see right you're facing a problem you think it looks one way today sleep on it you find out hey there's some, this part I wasn't even thinking about because I couldn't see it when I first looked and now your scientific thought is telling you only pay attention to what you can see and somehow we raising that up so as I said there's this renaissance happening there's this renaissance happening this revival of original culture of the human being in this renaissance in this renaissance every human being will have to realize that in this system we find ourselves in today you are the only one that sees yourself as an individual this system sees you as a number the system sees you where you fall into place for the budget plan or the statistic sheet and you can't blame them this is the life this is the blood you holding you holding it you better take responsibility for it we say in Kemet if you think that life is about fun then while you're busy having fun, who's taking care of your life? Our people are going to have to wake up to this reality. We have to wake up to this reality and see that we are being led further and further away from the logics that connect us to this earth, which gives us our livelihood, to the logics that connect us to survival so that we can forfeit them to somebody else who can take care of our life while we busy having fun this is what the earth center is doing reviving the origins the earth center was built as the first mission sent out to humanity by the traditional traditional initiation systems to let humanity know the things that are being studied in Egyptology, the things that are being talked about, uh, some of the some of the feats that our ancestral cultures accomplished that we still can't figure out today in the modern world, all of that knowledge is still here. All of that knowledge is still here. It's been protected. It's been preserved. And now it's the time where the energies are present make it possible for you to return to it again now whatever restraint was on the children of Kofi that wouldn't allow you to come back to your culture that restraint is off and the only restraint that's there is the one you put in there so now is the time where you can come back to your ancestral culture again and become whole again and see what this life has to offer you In the Earth Center, we follow a calendar of 10-day weeks. We don't follow the calendar of seven days. In the Earth Center, we follow the original set of 77 commandments. We don't follow the commandments that were shortened to 10 for the political ambitions. I mean, that's, that's everybody ask yourself, if I'm following 10 rules or I'm following 77 rules which one makes me more quality individual or let's put it like this you being my neighbor would you rather me follow 10 or would you rather me follow 77 because maybe in that 67 I left behind is talking about killing you right <laughs> 67 that's not even a small amount that's the majority that's our origins we call that the code of human behavior that's the rules that it took
to be human. So what are we? What are we now? Well, the Earth Center, every year, we lead a spiritual pilgrimage. Everybody heard of the concept of pilgrimage, right? Even some of the modern religions have adopted the concept of pilgrimage. In the modern world, there's no pilgrimage that I've heard of that I know by any of the uh, spiritual or modern institution that pilgrimages to Merita or pilgrimages to Africa. But even the science will tell us that Africa is the cradle of civilization. It's where the first bones are found. It's humanity's homeland. And then you're taking me on pilgrimage, and we're not going there? We're going to go around that one? We have to wake up this mind. The Earth Center once a year leads an annual pilgrimage to Merita. We go not, necess not, to, not necessarily to the places that you look today and you see the remnants of the culture, like the Nile Valley and things like this. Because you can see the remnants of the culture there. But remember, I said nothing has been lost. Things have only been preserved in secrecy. So we go where it's actually alive now, being preserved in humble villages to keep the eyes of those who they were trying to protect it from away. We'll be leaving on this year's pilgrimage on December 5th. We're very excited for this year's pilgrimage because this year marks the five-year anniversary of Master Naba's uh, entrance into the world of the dead. This year marks the five-year anniversary of, of his transition. As I was saying, there are many levels to taking care of our ancestors on the other side, and the five-year mark marks a very important level and so we will all be taking care or we will all be honoring Masanaba with certain ceremonies that are done um, certain ceremonies that are done and not only his initiates from here but because of who he was in the traditions many temples and things will be uh, traveling to different areas they will all be honoring him as well because they all know what he did to come and get us to come and provide us with a link back home. So that's one of the reasons we're very excited. Another reason we're very excited is that this year also happens to be the year that the family of Master Naba is reopening their temples to the world. And like I said, when I said this is a renaissance, that's not a joke. That's not a joke. I'm not playing up something. This is a renaissance that you're alive to be a part of. But it's going to be your decision making that allows you to be a part of it or watch it as a bystander. Because Master Naba's family, the bloodline of the Naba, are very important to human spirituality. The Naba bloodline is the uh, Dogon bloodline. Many people have heard the word Dogon. But Dogon has a very, uh, we kind of have a misconception of Dogon provided by the academia, provided by the anthropologist who went to some of the Dogon lands to study and then write books and come back and give us those books. I think today there are over 100 books written about the Dogon. I know of one by a Dogon. And that one is back there on the, on the table. So this year, uh, one of the Dogon bloodlines, to make it kind of to correct some of the misconceptions, the Dogon are bigger than just the, the tribe or tribal group in Mali, but it's a, it's a group of bloodlines that run through different parts of, of Africa, a lot in West Africa, uh, that are the elite bloodlines are the ones who, who took care of the highest level of knowledge for different aspects of society. So you had a Dogon bloodline taking care of the knowledge of farming, a Dogon bloodline taking care of the knowledge of kingships, a Dogon bloodline taking care of the knowledge of spirituality, astronomy, 
and that's the one that the Nabas were. The Nabas were the ones to take care of the spirituality, the spiritual life of the Pharaoh. And they were the ones really given the responsibility of being the uh, middle person between the divine world and humanity because they did so well with this responsibility. The kings, even in West Africa now, they all honored the Nabas because of how well they stuck to their values. They kept everything tight, very pure in preserving this for us. So even now when a Naba goes into a palace, the, the Naba never bows to the king. The king will even bow to the Naba before the Naba will bow to the king. So this bloodline is very, very important to humanity very important to humanity and this year those temples that all of the kings really valuing that before all of humanity was really valuing through the pharaoh those temples are going to be opened once again for the first time in 2500 years so we go in for those reopening ceremonies they will be open from here on out you will see how humanity starts to change you will see even more if you start to change and wake up uh, this ancestral spirit inside of you. The third reason is for the spiritual pilgrimage that we generally take. The spiritual pilgrimage that the Earth Center leads is unlike no other. We travel to different historic sites, different spiritual sites, different temples, different initiatic communities, uh, all with a chance, given the travelers, given the pilgrims giving the initiates a chance to participate, a chance to experience the living culture of Kemet, the living culture of our ancestor, uh, ancestral heritage. So this year we will be traveling to different temples through Burkina Faso, through Togo, and through Benin. So uh, to say again, we're very excited. Maybe you could tell. Um, last year, Last year, we visited a, ro a royal court in Bobo Julasso. It was a royal court of the Bobo people. And we sat, they received us. They brought their whole royal court out to receive us. They told us how happy they were to see us. They told us how much in support they are of what Masanaba was doing. And they told us to bring a message back to the people on the Manu side or the, the side of the Americas or the side of the colonial territories. And what they said was, tell them, they said first, they said, the ancestors are alive in us. And our ancestors were in harmony. We come in from the same place. That's why you're able to sit here now. You see us here now and we have harmony, we're not fighting. Whatever they were telling you, like we were the ones to send you out, don't listen to that because if that's true, we couldn't have this harmony now. We've been waiting for you guys to come home. And then they said, bring our message to everybody out there. Let them know that the way we live is a choice. The way we live is not because we are shorthanded. It's not because we lack resources. It's not because we wish we were in the shoes of the people in the colonial world. We choose to live this way, to live simple, to live humble, because we're the ones connected to nature like this. We're the ones holding what our ancestors gave us like this. We wouldn't trade this for anything. Make sure everybody knows we're not suffering like this. This is what we're choosing to do. And then he said, make sure they all know we haven't lost anything. And if they're interested in finding themselves, we're here to receive them because we haven't lost anything. This is the renaissance that's taking place right now. This is why the Earth Center is here. Masanaba brought a lot of treasures from the traditional system of spirituality. There are some prayer kits in the back teaching you the original form of 
meditation, the original form of prayer. Even the prayers that the initiates do, the prayers that priests in the temples do every day, mor every morning and every evening, except for on those days of rest, you are honoring yourself in the name of those divine elements that I said spirituality must start with. And in the name of your very first ancestors, the very first ancestors of humanity. When I said, this is what the Earth Center is doing, waking up the origins, this is not a joke. So everything is there for you. If you wish to come home, Masanaba used to say, the first, the first symptom, the first sign of mental illness is if you're in the bush and you don't know how to get home. I would like to thank everybody for coming out. I'd like to thank you for lending your ear tonight, uh, giving us your attention tonight. I hope that you will think about some of the things that we said. Hope that you will look into what the EC has to offer, what your ancestral traditions have to offer. I hope that you will look into some of the services we offer and at least get started in some of the uh, basic level things you can do to start taking care of your ancestors. I would like to open the floor now to any questions. If there are any questions from the lecture, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good question. I can only do so much. And when you guys told me an hour and 45 minutes, then I knew I was close. But really, reincarnation is a big part of uh, comedic culture, comedic spirituality. In Kemet, we say that every birth is the reincarnation of an ancestor. This means that when we come back to life, just as we were saying, there's no empty space. When it's time for us to come to life as babies, we are going to come through our descendants because that's the only space we have there that's designated for us. So the reincarnation really is a very, very uh, complicated thing because there's many there's many deities controlling different aspects of reincarnation. There's many aspects to the reincarnation, many phases, even many different uh, levels to the world of the dead and where you are depending on what time you are before your reincarnation occurs, et cetera, et cetera. But what I can say that's very important for us to realize is just what I, or how I can repeat myself in something that I already said was that our culture is founded on the idea that this life don't belong to us. You can't hijack life. You can't receive life from your parents and then say, hey, it's mine. Whatever responsibilities you guys think I should have, I don't care. I'm living to, to have fun. Because the same way your parents sacrificed their freedom, this idea of freedom, the same way they sacrificed this idea of fun, the same way they sacrificed all of the desires they maybe would have wanted to do if they didn't have the child running around. They did all of that, and that's what gave you a chance to be here. And now, those ancestors that did that, each one did that so that you could be here, even as you go back. It wasn't just your parents. Your grandparents did it too. That's the only way we got here. And now they're in the world of the dead waiting on us to do it too so they can come back. And nowadays in the philosophy of hijacking life, you see people like, well, I don't have enough money to have children. Well, no, it, it's not the right time right now. Let me go abort the baby. But these are ancestors waiting. Uh, I can say, you know, short of the initiatic aspect that the reincarnation generally takes up to seven generations. On, on, the, on the general level, on the basic level. Now, you think about an ancestor that died, maybe they didn't get to do everything they wanted to do. They're like, okay, I have to wait. Seven generations pass, everything is aligned perfectly. And then their child say, no, I'm not ready to let go of my freedom yet. And now the door is snatched shut on them. 
we have to wake up. We have to realize that life is bigger than our desires. Life is bigger than the tastes that these advertising companies and things are selling us. Life is bigger than that. Life has been something since the beginning of time for humanity. We can't say there was ever a time in human history that you didn't have birth, you didn't have getting old, you didn't have dying, you didn't have reincarnating. That's been around since the beginning. Whatever things we were distracting ourselves with, that's always been here. Now these careers that we're chasing now, white man's money we're chasing now, all of that stuff is new. And you're going to forsake the things that have been around this whole time for those things? In 200 years, how are you going to look to your descendants? if you're lucky enough to have them. So uh, that's what I could say about reincarnation unless you have a specific question. Good, good question, sir. Um, first, and f first off, though, at the Earth Center, we don't say ancient because ancient denotes the idea that it came, it died, and we're looking way back in history to find it. But really, like I'm telling you, this stuff alive today. Even at the Earth Center, Masanaba didn't teach the language you're talking about with books because he knew it. He grew up speaking it. He grew up. It. He grew up. It, with it in the initiations having been taught to him he said even while he was traveling kind of he traveled a lot searching different museums for the things they took from us to kind of see what was out there outside of the culture and he said he's here while he's studying those type of things he can he can find he hearing people talk about the pharaonic language the pharaonic language is dead and all this and he even started asking himself like man what language are they talking about I want to find out about that language. And then he has to re realize they're talking about the language I know, the language I speak. That's not dead. But to white men, it's dead because our ancestors succeeded at keeping it secret. But uh, the Medu, we refer to it as the Medu because the Medu is like the general language. That language is a tiered language, meaning it has levels. So that's another way that helped us keep it secret. The language that we teach in the Earth Center, which is providing the bridge, providing those who have had that mind corrupted before seven by the new philosophies, they want to come back and get back into their traditions. We have to realize we're beginners. No matter what we thought we studied outside of the initiation, inside the initiation, we're beginners. So we have to start at the beginning level. The Medu Mait is what the beginning level is. The Medu Neter is the highest level because medu mait will mean like new that means it's new to the person learning it the medu neter is the language of the gods the highest form of the language so you see anybody that's studying it through anthropology through some through a culture that thinks it's dead they'll have to call it medu neter because that's the one you can see when you look at the things that you can dig up because those, that's the form of the medu we put on the uh, pyramids and we put in the tombs and things like that because we're trying to connect with the gods, sending our ancestors, saying, please take them, take care of them. But when you're talking about uh, all through the society, you have an order to the language. The language is, as I said, the first language of humanity. Therefore, it is the original language. It's the language that was given to humanity by the gods. That means those who created the existence and those who maintain it, they were the ones to assign this sound to the concept that you're trying to speak when you talk about that sound. So that's why even I, I talked about those sounds when we're talking about east and, and west and south and north. Can you see how they fit into the existence that they built? Every language after that is really like a dialect 
that human being said, okay, well, we need to change it for this reason, you know, to fit the, what we're going through in this side of the world. And then you have dialects of dialects and dialects of dialects, et cetera, et cetera. Wait, wait, sir, wait, sir. Let me see if anybody else, because I don't mind, but I don't want you to get in trouble with those. Is there, does anybody else have any questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't really want you to confuse yourself with them, but uh, there's some uh, beholder. Yeah, I mean, we even uh, broadcasting live over the internet. I don't want to confuse people, and the Earth Center don't stand with them. But if you come and talk to me afterwards, I can let you know. But there's one called uh, a Dogon Perspective Philosophy Podium in the back. Yes. Yes, yes. Yes. Yes, it actually introdu it actually it's a very good question because every initiate will go through it. Every person trying to hunt for truth is going to go through that. Because now uh the, we have a saying, we have a quote from one of our prophets in the culture. The prophet Tahotep said that when stupidity is rewarded, wisdom becomes useless. And that's the world that we're living in today. That's the world that we're living in today. That's just a sad reality. Like I said, all of those things, even, even the very basic things you call in like scientific truths, north on the top, south on the bottom, just a few seconds, I crushed that. You see, I showed you how how small those logics are. When stupidity is rewarded, wisdom becomes useless. And now you find people, well, why are you gonna go study that? How can that make you money? How can that get you a job? You know, all of these things. So it's a very good question. And it's difficult. There's nobody that will tell you it's not difficult. That's just the, the bottom line of it. You will have to have some courage and face uh, the opinions of others that are holding on to you know what the the general mass movements are which way they're moving um, but everybody has to face that we all will have to make the choices while we hold the blood that we hold that will allow us to sleep with ourselves you can make the choice to listen to the opinions of the family and then you have to be tormented when you put the pillow on the when you put the head on the pillow as to what you know you should be doing what you know it makes more sense to you but what keeps but you're trying to keep the family quiet or you have to deal with the family's opinions the family's ideas while you put in the head on the pillow and you're able to be at peace with yourself um but yeah it's very difficult uh, you, you have to challenge yourself, um, but that's really a part of learning any anything when you really learn it, you know. Um, but it brings up another very important aspect that I didn't mention because when I say that the world is upside down, the world is upside down. Now, that notion of the elders being the one to guide the society, and this not any... Um, offense to any elder here we value the elders at the earth center but the reality of it now is the elders are even the one that will help colonize the youth because the el it has been put in the elders the value system has been put in the elders because kofi has grown up now so kofi's now grandpa and now when gr the grandson maybe is trying to say well what did what did great 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 grandpa do before kofi did this kofi gonna be like no don't look there so we have a very interesting situation, but we have a revival happening. You have support, a whole worldwide support, if you're ready to take that step, but it's not gonna be easy. Uh, yes, next question. Yes, Ella. Uh, 
Uh, every year we go to different areas, uh, depending on which temples are ready for us, depending on where we're being directed um, from our elders and things. But um, this year, well, let me say first, every year we kind of base the pilgrimage around Burkina Faso because we have our our school that serves as our headquarters in on the side of Africa in Burkina Faso, Ouagadougou. Uh, Burkina Faso is a landlocked country in Central West Africa, north of Ghana and Togo. So we usually fly in there because that's where our center is. Everybody meets the, the initiates and the, the elders of the center there, and then we travel to different places from there. This year we'll be traveling south to Togo and then east to Benin. Uh, in Benin, the area of Benin on the coast is very, very uh, frequented by tourists uh, because it really, a lot of people, whenever you're talking about slave castles and things um, in the history of the slave trade and how um, some of the, the descendants of, of Africa got to the Americas, we point to Ghana and the slave castles there because that's really been built up in tourism but even the majority a much higher percentage of people were leaving from the area between togo and benin and we're visiting some temples that are in that area there's actually even a ceremony that i didn't mention um, when i was speaking about this year's pilgrimage that is happening at the um in Wida, where the temples there they put on a big ceremony in honor of what happened in that area, you know, losing so many. Now people are starting to come back, trying to bring more energies, to bring more people back and to uh, revive the culture, like I'm saying. Uh, we are leaving December 5th. We leave December 5th from New York. We arrive there on December 6th. We will be returning in February, I believe February 13th. Can somebody correct me if I'm wrong? February 13th. Um, there's also a three-week trip. That's two months. There's also a three-week trip that's leaving uh, December 5th, arriving December 6th, and leaving um, December 31st or January 1st, something like that. Usually every year we take a three-week trip and a two-month trip. The two-month trip is usually the one that's uh, for initiates and the three week trip is open to anybody this year because of how important the things are with the Naba temples and the ceremonies for Masanaba everybody's invited for two months so uh, that's how it will go this year no problem thank you Ella. any other questions yes sir Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, any compliments you have to me, I'm just going to give to him, though, because I'm very, very appreciative of him coming and bringing this for us, giving us a chance. Yes, sir. You're trying to get, you don't have to worry about whatever you were planning. There's, if you were told that, then it's okay. But uh, the, the general trips are the dates I was mentioning. There are some people who ask for uh, accommodations, like where we'd be in a certain time. And there's some people that are leaving January 2nd and meeting us on the coast in Togo instead of in Burkina. So, yes, you're correct. No, no worries. Yes, sir. Like to 
you a shadow of life, or does it feel like kind of a, a part of that spectrum? Um, wow, that question seems kind of deep, and I don't understand every part of it. It is it how do I integrate what aspect of uh, other cultures and ancestral traditions and things like that with what I'm doing? Um, I, if I understand the question, I don't necessarily try to integrate it because humanity, one of the beautiful things about humanity is that we diverse. So even me standing here now I'm not asking anybody to follow my ancestors or worship my ancestors. I'm asking you to wake up and honor yours. So the f I don't try to integrate other cultures because in life you have to uh, fight from the identity that nature gave you. Uh, and in doing so, that brings you across many diverse peoples all holding and fighting for their culture and even that's one thing that uh, the Earth Center is also doing. We work with other traditional uh, elders of indigenous communities just fighting to uh, unite and to promote people going back to their ancestral culture because nowadays you have like what people call indigenous and nowadays you have modern and even though every human being they look far enough into their ancestry and they see indigenous every human being no matter how scared they are of what maybe indigenous Africa is doing they look far enough in their ancestry and one of them was doing it too no matter what color they find themselves today one of them was doing it so we all uniting to fight for that, but we know we standing in a certain place. We have to do it the way we standing in the place we standing to honor our ancestors. So I, uh, I wouldn't say that I try to integrate it, but we very. Um, once you really kind of start learning and start learning the traditions, like I'm saying, these walls that were put up to separate people start of start coming down because you see how small the logics in them are. And what was the, if that answers your first, what was the second one? Okay, right on. Right on. Uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. The most important things that, or discoveries that our ancestors will say that they made was discovering the world of the gods. And so, like I'm saying, it's very hard to understand now what it will look like when humanity discovers the world of the gods and can start to interact with the world of the gods. It's hard for us to understand that because, like I'm saying here, we built on superstition. I'm discovering the world of the gods sitting in my room. I'm in trouble. I can discover the world of the gods. Oh, Jesus, I need you right now. No matter what, no matter what I'm doing. I could even be on the toilet saying that. Maybe it's hurting when it come out. I say, oh, God, why is God listening to me at that point? I don't listen to you. You have caca coming out of your butt. I'm not going to listen. And now that pure being, he's supposed to, I'm, I can meet him like that. That's the superstitions we hold in today. So this idea of human culture evolving itself to a quality position 
a position quality enough to interact with the world of the gods. That was the biggest uh, discovery that we made, and that led to many things. But all of that you learn about in the initiation. Any other questions? Yes. My main man. You, I'm talking about you, my main man. This is bigger than my main man. This is, that was a very, very good question. I will end the lecture on that question. I always like the questions from the children because they go right where they need to go. Um, this representation behind me is a, a comedic god, a comedic, di a comedic divinity. His traditional name is Wisr. Wisr. You could also hear it said Uzri. Uzri. And you hear the uh, Romans call him Osiris. You hear some of the uh, German mispronunciations of Wisr Asar. Uh, he has many names all over the world. But uh, you kind of answering the brother's question because this is one of the most important gods to humanity. He's seen as our ancestral father, and he came many times to earth to teach us many of the things that you're asking about. But this is uh, kind of like the next step in uh, spirituality. We have a lecture by Master Naba where he's st talking about uh, a spiritual text that we have explaining um, one of the lifetimes of Whistler. It's called the holy drama, so maybe you can ask that to get it for you. Um, once again, I would like to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, as I said, I want to end with with the youth's question. Every uh, every birth is a reincarnation of an ancestor, so he's one of the ones closest to the ancestors, uh, him and the the elders that are here. So. I'm not kicking you out, but we ending it. <laughs> we ending it here. I would like to really thank everybody for coming. Please enjoy some of the refreshments, the food. <laughs> thank you once again. Uh, please stick around, ask questions to some of the initiates. Um, catch me walking around, ask me questions. I'm not tired, but we have to wrap it up at some point. Thanks again.